In the deep dark, the Aslan are moving, but there is a darker power. There is something behind the claw. Welcome to episode 25 of the Behind the Claw podcast, a show for fans of the classic Traveller RPG. I'm Felbrick Napoleon Herriot. Let's start the show by taking a look in the email vault. Okay. Now, on to the first segment. I have no idea. So, computer, what can you tell me about this place? This is the My Galaxy segment, where I tell you about a planet in my Tercesso subsector. A map and planetary UPPs are available on the podcast's website at behindtheclaw.blogspot.co.uk. The Kukaros is a very much hands-off system, as far as the Imperium are concerned. The reason for this attitude is that the corporate management that run the entire system have thrice threatened an embargo of exports, exports that the Imperium is hungry for. These include very important weapon systems and starship technology that are in high demand. The Kukar Corporation has been in charge of the system for many decades and has established complete control. There is little that happens in system that is not directly under the eye of the corporation. Having said that, the various departments operate in a competition with each other. There are multiple computer and ship manufacturers all of which bid for available contracts in competition with each other. The mindset being that with this internal competition, it pushes the various elements to evolve and develop better and more efficient systems. It seems to be working, as the system is one of the most successful technology exporters in the sector. There is no single settled world in the system. Rather, the five or six million employee civilians live upon a number of planetoids that share similar orbits. It has been theorised that these planetoids were once part of some super planet that underwent a massive impact, leaving the remaining fragments orbiting in place of that one planet. This seems to be borne out by the very similar geological makeup of the various planetoids. None of these planetoids retain an atmosphere, and all corporate settlements are either extensive surface domes or large stations orbiting the primary along with the planetoids. There are few standard trade goods that interest the people of Kukaros, as they are fully self-sufficient and massive exporters. However, an independent trader can make money with exotic alien artefacts or exceptional pieces of art, which are in high demand among collectors within the higher ranks of the corporate structure. The Imperium maintains a scout base in system, which is rarely manned and is more of an Imperial status symbol than an active station. Indeed, any visiting Imperial Navy or scout ships are often swarmed by local system ships that keep them from coming too near to the Corporation's facilities. With its own large and well-equipped local Navy and extensive array of forts, Kukar actively resents any military coming too close. There have been talks, behind closed doors, of ejecting the Imperial base from the system and banning any Imperial representatives from interfering in system at all but as yet they have decided that the Imperium is still too large and too strong to be forcibly removed. As you might imagine, the space in and around the system is heavily monitored and patrolled. All visitors should broadcast their appearance in system and their reasons for arrival as soon as exiting jump space, or risk attack from the local Navy patrols or the missile-armed automated forts. No, no, no way. The way I heard it is that he was shipping arms, guns, you know, taking them straight in, under the navvy's nose. Time for another story seed. The Down on Their Luck PCs are approached by a businessman named Felice, with an interesting offer. He's developed a new soft drink called Fizz Pop Bang. It's a carbonated drink with an entirely new flavour that he believes will revolutionise the industry. He has samples which he will offer around for the people to try. The gimmick that the drink features is that the bottles always explode loudly with an explosion of gas 
but don't spray drink everywhere due to a new design of lid, and of course the flavour, which is also a selling point. This flavour is a blend of bacon and cheese. Everyone who tries it will find the flavour pleasurable. Felice claims to have developed the drink himself and is now trying to break into the market. He's landed venture capital to fund the drink, but needs someone to manage the marketing via word of mouth. He presents the PCs with access to a bank account, with funds to open a small ice cream bar-like venue, and create a groundswell of demand for the drink. The PCs are to set it up and start running the business, and he, of course, will take the profits. But here's the rub. The drink contains small amounts of a poisonous chemical. If drunk in sufficient quantities, the consumer falls ill and dies. Felice knows this, hence the reason he set up this cut-out business and hired the PCs as his fall guys. He expects to make a mint, but sees no reason why he should take the fall if the worst happens. The bank account is set up in the name of one of the PCs. The drink supplier is an independent who picks it up from a factory that has no signs, and when visited, no one can be found. The lease for the factory and for the shop are also in the name of one of the PCs. It's a complete set-up job. The police will come for the PCs, and their only hope is to get away and find the man who has set them up. Felice himself is no physical threat to the PCs. He's not a martial artist, and he's not any better than the average man at handling a pistol. He is clever. He always plans an escape route, and he can hire cheap thugs to watch out for his personal protection. It'll also be fun to have them pursued, the PCs that is, by a named NPC detective. Perhaps have him directing regular cops to surround the party. He'll be the one making the calls for surrender over the loud hailer. He'll do the interviews, and there's always a chance they might convince him of the truth, but he doesn't have to trust them. No, sir, you may not dock here. What the hell? I just made three jumps to get here. Without Permit 7C, you may not dock. Now move out to the holding line at 6,000 kilometres. This is Rules Talk, where I talk about some aspect of the classic traveller rules or canon. Today I'm pondering the other career from the basic rules. Looking in the 1977 rules, there does not appear to be a description of the other. It's just left there hanging, unexplained. By 1981, they'd come up with the following description. Characters who do not serve in one of the above areas instead follow unproductive careers with a variety of experiences. The other service covers some trades, ne'er-do-wells, and the shady realm of the underworld. The exact nature of the career of any specific character in the other field must be deduced from the skills and benefits received during character generation. Deducing the previous career based on these skills sounds like fun, although they do seem to be suggesting it's going to be rather unsavoury, and calling it unproductive is a bit harsh. This is probably Han Solo's path, I guess. By the time we get to the starter edition of Classic Traveller, it's been expanded a little further. In there, they say that a character with bribery and forgery skills might as easily have been an imperial spy as an underworld crook. But again, you have to deduce the actual career from the skills it generates. So let's look at some of the skills and see what I can come up with. The table starts out with benefits to strength, dexterity and endurance. So a boxer, perhaps, or a bricklayer who spends all day carrying bricks around. Blade combat is here as well, but that could be a professional fencer, or of course a back alley thug. The brawling skill could be a wrestler, a bodyguard, or perhaps a bouncer. A negative social standing adjustment is here as well, and this could be an unfortunate event in the past, perhaps being arrested or going bankrupt, or maybe even a very public breakup with a video star. Vehicle skills could reflect any driving trade, taxi, chauffeur, bodyguard again, maybe a trucker, a delivery agent, or even a getaway man. The gambling skill could be fun. It could be a gambling-addicted dropout, a professional card sharp, or that guy who always wins at the slot machines, or maybe he's a jockey with the inside dope on which horses are likely to win. Bribery comes up as well, but this is more of a social skill, really. 
is as much about knowing who to bribe and how to make them go for the deal as it is about getting results. Corporate execs could use this skill to win business deals, and a thug could use it to escape jail time. Gun combat, well, that goes without saying. That could be a bank robber, the bodyguard, a rich hobbyist who likes to shoot, or even a hunter. Streetwise skill sounds like the ex-cop turned P.I., or a pusher on the corner of the street, or the mom who needs to make a buck to feed the kids. The mechanical skill could be a vehicle mechanic, perhaps the guy who strips a stolen car for parts, or a civilian that maintains military vehicles, a builder perhaps, a miner, or a hobbyist maker. Next up is the humble electronic skill. Of course, you could be a general electrician, or perhaps a ham radio operator, or a sneak thief who adjusts people's burglar alarms, or even a telecoms engineer. The forgery skill could be the guy printing credits, or a prisoner of war forging escape papers, or as suggested by the rules themselves, perhaps a spy. Medical skill, well, that could be a nurse, a drunken doctor, or perhaps the number one fan. Maybe even a mining supervisor who took a medical course. Computers, well, that's a computer engineer, possibly a hacker, the script kiddie, or a mainframe operator, or even the guy who installs computers in the shipyards. And last of all, we have the jack of all trades. Who knows what that is? Is it just a knack, or luck, or a very good education? It's the MacGyver skill, so it could be anything from a cyborg implant, or even magic. So we do have lots of options for possible career paths through the other path. Not just criminal, and not necessarily unproductive, as the rules suggest. Did you hear that? What the hell do you think it is? Is it dangerous? This is the Creature Catalogue, where I tell you about one of the alien creatures that can be found in and around the Imperium. The tree bear of Nuina is notable as being one of the few naturally psionic animals that can psionically interact with humans. The tree bear is a mammal weighing up to about 20 pounds when full grown. It's covered in a shaggy fur that varies in colour but predominantly in shades of white. Although a quadruped, it spends most of its time in the trees of its homeworld, and thus has long toes or fingers on each limb, as well as a prehensile tail that equals the length of the body. The tail is not as dexterous as its fingers, not as strong as any of its limbs, but it is always found wrapped around a nearby supporting branch. The end of the tail is noted as being barbed, but not poisonous, the barbs are not used for gripping, but during the territorial fights between females and during mating. As the weapons, they are rather vicious, as they lodge in the skin of a foe and are ripped free when the animals separate. During mating, they are applied to the neck of the male in an apparent threat to hold them in place. The face of the tree bear is covered in a shorter fur than covers the rest of its body, and this reveals a face generally thought of as rather abhorrent. In the centre of its face is a sphincter-like mouth that is surrounded by bony protuberances that act as both teeth and raspers. Its three eyes are set equidistantly around the mouth, and each can be extended to a distance of about three inches on flexible stalks, although this usually only happens when the animal is eating. This appears to be a precaution and used to observe for predators while its head is pointed downwards to consume prey. After a gestation period of a month or so, the females give birth to live young in a fleshy egg sac, which they transport to any nearby males. The males have a pocket or sac in which the egg is deposited. Here the sac fuses with the male's flesh, and the baby within starts to suckle the blood of the foster father. The sac usually disappears within days of implantation, and after another month or so, the baby is weaned and emerges from the sac. The foster father then becomes aggressively protective of the baby for a few days, often protecting a small territory against all comers. The most fascinating feature of the tree bear is its empathic psionic communication. Although it's not unknown for animals to communicate in ways believed to be psionic, the tree bear is particularly unusual because its emotions can be picked up by any humans with psionic ability. In the early years of discovery, this led to some strange interactions. The tree bears were afraid of humans that came near, 
and projected an aura of fear. This affected nearby psionic humans after making them run away in fear. This communication was not limited to just a fear reaction, however, and people were also able to pick up feelings of pleasure or even lust. The attitude of people on the tree bear's homeworld to the animal is generally one of disgust and dislike. They're not pleasant to look at, their weird mouths and eyes often turning the stomachs of those that see them, and the dangers posed by the barbed tail make them unsuitable as pets or for domestication. Have you got that feed ready? Yep, feeding it through now. Got it, thanks. That net feed's got a weird name. What is it? Whale song. The captain likes whale song? This is On The Nets, where I tell you about some goodie that I found on the interwebby tubes. Today I'm practically breaking the law and talking about non-classic traveller product. Clutch your pearls, but do not faint, I beg thee. Today's find is an entire campaign written for Mongoose Traveller that's free to download. If you go to mongoosepublishing.com and search for Drinax, that's D-R-I-N-A-X, you'll be able to download the campaign. This isn't a review, so I won't go into it too far, but there are ten adventures with some very nice ship's plans and some of my favourite pictures of Aslan. Being mongoose, its compatibility with classic is not really a concern, so go get it. Seriously, it's free. The Pirates of Drinax. So I'm here. Why don't you tell me why you're cold? There's a spacer in the corner booth. Don't stare at him. I see him. Who is he? It's the guy on the news vids. Which news vids? There are thousands of channels. Crookwatch. Ah, I see. This is the People of Interest segment, where I tell you about someone from the Imperium that has a bit of a reputation. Dr. Kailak Shasan is another in a long list of scientists that have gone missing in the last 20 years. Some have suggested that there is a campaign of kidnappings in progress, as someone or some organisation is trying to gain a private access to the high technologies the scientists were working on. Be that as it may, the kidnap of Kailak Shasan has a number of interesting points. Kylax had a background of 20 years working in radionics and passive detection systems for starships, but he has also been running a private part-time project on his own time that may have finally started to show promise. Of course, as everyone is aware, communication with or between ships that are in jump is impossible. Dr. Shasan, however, did not believe it was impossible, just very, very tricky and thus had been dedicating his spare time to investigating and working on this problem. When this course of study came to light in an interview about a decade ago, the scientific press was more than doubtful, but actively ridiculed him and his work. The impossibility of such communication had been mathematically proved centuries before, and accepted as incontrovertible fact. Kylax wasn't phased by the torrent of laughing, and continued with his private project. Five years ago, he managed to convince the Bythinacle Corporation to sponsor his work by providing him with access to a stateroom on their transports, in which he would be able to conduct his experiments. For a share of any future profits, they were happy to invest a single stateroom on occasional journeys. Once this agreement was reached, Dr. Kylak started taking every opportunity to use these staterooms, and the crew of the transports have reported that he was rarely seen while on board, and was always at work on the computer terminal and tinkering with the machinery he had brought on board. As a companion to his shipboard working, he also managed to have his employer, for a share of any future profits, mount some of his devices on board a satellite in orbit over his homeworld. This was a transmitter-receiver station for his experiments. The local police were called to the doctor's home by concerned neighbours who reported the sound of gunfire. On entering his home, they discovered a body, but it was not the doctor. On the floor of his bedroom, they found the freshly killed corpse of an Aslan. The creature was armed and had a laser pistol in his paw. It had been killed by a 10 millimeter bullet. The police noted that the doctor owned a pistol of that caliber, but that could not be found. 
the room presented evidence of a struggle, and all of the doctor's equipment was missing. Of course, the assumption is that some branch of the Aslan tribal tree had become aware of the doctor's work, and so mounted a raid to take him and keep the technology out of the imperial hands. It has been surmised that perhaps the doctor has made a breakthrough, and that was what prompted the kidnapping, although no evidence of such a discovery has been found in his absence. No Aslan vessels were reported on the planet at the time, and no ransom demand has ever been made. The police have put this kidnapping into the cold case file. My God, sir, they've launched a missile. It's it's tracking. Have they now? Don't fret, Thome. I've got something special to handle that. Lancelot, activate my special defensive feature. The following piece of flash fiction is a fictionalised account of events that actually occurred during a session of Classic Traveller that was run back in Gen Con in 2013. Rumours by Daniel Mendike A motley group of six humans, self-named the Dawners because they were the crew of the free trader Tranquility Dawn, were currently on Floral Base, a space station built into a large asteroid in the Floral Star System. They were seeking cargo and or a high-paying job. They were almost broke again. Their last few cargo runs had barely covered expenses and an annual maintenance on their ship would soon be required. Having exhausted the standard resources used in finding cargo or work, they started a dialogue with anyone on the station who would hear them out. In one of the two bars on the base, they met an interesting feather-covered alien who apparently was doing the books for the bar in his handheld computer. The alien very politely listened to the Dawners, but regrettably had no cargo or work for them. It did suggest that perhaps a resident scientist studying in the tunnels below the station might need their services. In exchange for this advice, all that the alien asked was that the Dawners returned and described in detail their encounter with the scientist. Although highly suspicious of advice given apparently so cheaply, the Dawners sought out permission to visit the deep tunnels at the heart of this asteroid. This was actually rather easy to come by, requiring only the better part of a day, a bit of carousing with some off-duty base security agents, and the purchase of several rounds of intoxicating beverages. The good stuff, not the watered-down version normally served. Unfortunately, they felt their efforts were wasted. After spending a full day visiting the tunnels, they came to the conclusion that neither the scientist nor his research could profit them in any significant way. Disheartened by this failure and the waste of so much time, the Dawners nevertheless sat down to once again talk with the strange feathered alien. Perhaps because he believed the alien was not being entirely truthful, one of the Dawners hinted, just hinted, that they had learned information of some value during the trip in the tunnels. This was quickly picked up on by the rest of his crewmates, who each added a touch of embellishment to the now ever-growing story. In mere moments, the recounting of a meeting with a boring scientist who studied rocks took on an overt suggestion that mighty star empires would soon fall based on the strange findings in those exotic, mysterious and deadly caverns. Each human at the table was now actively trying to outdo the other with reports of devices that wield unimaginable energies, of alien races so fearsome that they use actual stars as weapons of war, of secrets so terrifying that the Emperor himself weeps in dread that they might be revealed. It was at this point that the feathered alien politely stopped the humans with a simple, softly worded comment, "'Perhaps you're not familiar with the rumour concerning my race?' Silence. Thick as jump space surrounded the alien and the six humans. After a breathless moment, one of the Dawners asked the question on everybody's mind. What rumour? That my race is telepathic, replied the feathered alien. Embarrassment thick as jump space surrounded the six humans who remained silent for several more moments. With a deep breath, one of the braver Dawners looked at the alien in the face and said, Perhaps you're not familiar with the rumour about us humans. With genuine curiosity, either to show that the rumour about his race was false, or simply to be polite, the feathered alien asked, 
what rumour would that be? The Dorna sat up straight and in a loud, proud voice said, That we're all assholes. Thanks for the trade, Tuchel. It was a pleasure doing business with you. So long, sucker. So once again we've reached the end game. I'd like to take the opportunity to tell you about my latest published scenario for Traveller. It's called Deanne's Gear and is designed for a one-shot game. In this scenario the PCs are hired guns, given the job of recovering valuable manufacturing equipment from a city that's in revolt. They must escort the convoy to the factory and then back to the starport through a city in flames with hatred burning behind every window and treachery waiting to explode. This scenario is available to buy from Drive Through RPG. Once again, and as usual, if you have any thoughts, suggestions, questions, or segment items, or stories, send them in to BehindTheClaw at Outlook.com. This podcast is released on an attribution, non commercial, no derivatives license. Its home on the web is at BehindTheClaw.blogspot.co.uk. Music by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. I'm your host, Felbrick Napoleon Herriot. Thanks for listening. Prepare for jump. <laughs>